Hello, I'm Michelle Kremmel, and in this lesson, we're going to be learning about the difference quotient. By the end of the lesson, you should be able to identify the derivative of a function as the limit of a difference quotient. Let's start by reviewing this formula for average rate of change. The average rate of change of a function f on a closed interval from a to b is given by the following formula. Average rate of change equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So we've seen this formula before. We worked with this when we were talking about average velocity. But if the function we're dealing with does not represent the position of an object at a certain time, then we can generalize this and just call it average rate of change. An average rate of change, again, we can think of as a slope because f of b is just the y-coordinate of the point where x equals b. So it's like we have this y-coordinate minus this other y-coordinate, f of a, so we'll call this one y2, and we'll call f of a y1. That's the y-coordinate at x equals a, and we're dividing that by the x-coordinate at point number 2 minus the x-coordinate for point number 1, and that, as you know, is just the formula for calculating a slope. So average rate of change can be thought of as the slope of something. We'll talk a little more about what it is the slope of here in a moment. And then we saw a different formula for average velocity. And again, we can generalize this now to just average rate of change. And here, the only difference is instead of defining our interval from a to b, we're defining it from a to a plus h. So if we go back to this formula and replace the b with an a plus h, we get this version of the formula, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. This is the average rate of change of our function f on the closed interval from a to a plus h. Now suppose that our function f, given by the graph below, has two points, a and a plus h. Let's locate and label the, those two points, a f of a and a plus h f of a plus h on our graph. So here's the point with the x-coordinate of a and a y-coordinate f of a. And here's the point with x-coordinate a plus h, y-coordinate f of a plus h. Next, we want to construct a right triangle whose hypotenuse is the line segment between those two points, a f of a and a plus h f of a plus h. So if I connect those two points with a line segment, we want that to be the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So now I'll draw the right triangle. And we're asked to find the lengths of the legs of the triangle. So the legs are the two sides that include the right angle. So the long leg at the bottom, let's think about this. What is the length of that long leg? Well, it's just the distance between A and A plus H. What's the distance between A and A plus H? To get horizontal distance, you just do the right value minus the left value. So that distance is a plus h minus a, which is just equal to h. Okay, so that leg of the triangle there has a length of h. Now, the other side of the triangle over here, we want that distance. And that distance, we take the top y-coordinate minus the bottom y-coordinate to get that distance right there. So the top y-coordinate is f of a plus h, and the bottom y-coordinate is f of a. So that distance is f of a plus h minus f of a. And let me write that a little closer to the triangle. So this is f of a plus h minus f of a. That's the length of that side of the triangle. Next, we're going to be asked to calculate the slope of the line segment connecting the points a f of a and a plus h f of a plus h. So we want the slope of the hypotenuse, not the length of the hypotenuse, the slope of the hypotenuse. So really just the slope between these two points right here. And how do you find slope between two points? Well, you can use your formula where you subtract the y-coordinates, y2 minus y1, and then divide that by the difference in the x-coordinates, x2 minus x1. You can also think of this as rise over run. 
to go from this point right here to this point right here, the rise is just this vertical distance and the run is this horizontal distance. Okay, so either way you would like to think about it, we get slope is f of a plus h minus f of a over h. That is the slope of the line connecting those two points. And we call a line connecting two points a secant line. So this is the slope of a secant line connecting those two endpoints. And this should look familiar because we were just working with this expression here. That is the average rate of change on our, of our function on our interval. Okay, so now we can think of that as the slope of the secant line passing through these two endpoints, a and a plus h. So let's summarize that here. The average rate of change of the function f, we should always name our function. So the average rate of change of the function f on the interval a comma a plus h is the slope of the secant line passing through the endpoints of the interval. So if I have two points on my function and I connect them by drawing a secant line, and here I just showed the line segment, it's part of the secant line, then the slope of that secant line will give me the average rate of change of the function on the interval between x equals a and x equals a plus h. Now we're ready to formally define this thing we call the derivative. Let f be a function with x equals a in its domain. So that tells us that a, when we see an a in the formula, it is an x value. It's just some x value in the domain of our function. So let f be a function with x equals a in its domain. We define the derivative of f with respect to x. So I'm going to highlight the derivative of f with respect to x, because that's the thing that we're defining here, the derivative of f with respect to x, evaluated at x equals a, denoted by f prime of a by the following formula. f prime of a equals the limit as h approaches 0, f of a plus h minus f of a over h, provided this limit exists. So let's read through that one more time. f is a function with x equals a in its domain. The derivative of the function f with respect to x evaluated at x equals a. So we're just thinking about what's happening on the graph of this function at the point where x equals a is denoted by f prime of a. So you heard me say f prime of a. This symbol right here, when we read it, we say prime, f prime of a, like that, f prime of a. That's called the derivative of f at x equals a. So this f prime of a is equal to the limit as h approaches 0, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Now if I take this away and we just have f of a plus h minus f of a over h, we just looked at that expression, that's the average rate of change of our function at the point where x equals a. Now if I bring the limit into that and I take the limit of that average rate of change, I'm going to get instantaneous rate of change. So we saw this back in lesson 1.1, uh, 1.2, how we could move from average velocity to instantaneous velocity by taking the limit of the average rate of change as that interval gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And that's the same thing that's happening here. So this expression here is an instantaneous 
rate of change. If I remove the limit as h approaches 0, it's an average rate of change. But when I take the limit as h approaches 0, it becomes an instantaneous rate of change. h is the width of our interval. If it, our interval starts at a and ends at a plus h, then h is the width of our interval. So we're letting h approach 0 means we're letting the width of the interval approach 0. Okay, so now we have instantaneous rate of change of f at the point where x equals a, and we're calling it by this special name and using the special notation, f prime of a. This is called the derivative. So now derivative is just another way of saying instantaneous rate of change. And then we have at the end here, provided this limit exists. So in our study of limits, we've seen that limits don't always exist. And if this limit doesn't exist, then this derivative doesn't exist. So it's possible that derivatives don't exist at certain points. Now the next few slides, I'm just going to sort of give you a preview of the types of things we're going to be working on. So you don't need to copy this down in your notes. Just look at it, think about it a little bit, and we're just going to get exposed to some new vocabulary words and see what kinds of questions we're going to be dealing with in this unit and the next unit. So the derivative and differentiability. If f prime of a exists, we say f of x is differentiable at x equals a. So we have some new vocabulary here. This word differentiable just means the derivative exists. If I tell you that the function is differentiable at x equals a, it means the derivative exists at x equals a. So there may be certain points on our graph where the derivative does not exist, and then we would say our function is not differentiable at that point. So differentiable is an adjective describing our function, and it tells us that the derivative does exist at a certain point. So again, if f prime of a exists, we say f is differentiable at x equals a. So differentiable adjective. We also have a verb version of that word, differentiate, and that means find the derivative of. So that's the verb. If I ask you to differentiate the function at x equals 5, it means find the derivative of the function when x equals 5. And we also have a noun version of that word differentiation. So differentiation is just like the noun for the derivative, all things involved with derivative. So the types of questions we might see that involve this idea of is the function differentiable could look like the following. Suppose we have some function f. Here, f of x equals 1 over x plus 1. I could ask you, is f differentiable at x equals 5? I could ask you to find the intervals on which f is differentiable. I could ask you to identify values where the function is not differentiable. So we will be doing all of those things. The derivative and instantaneous rate of change. f prime of a gives the instantaneous rate of change of f at the point x equals a. So we said that a moment ago. Instantaneous rate of change is another way of saying derivative. And f prime of a is the notation we use there. So all of those things are really just different ways of saying the same thing. They all represent the same concept. The derivative can also be called the instantaneous rate of change. We can also call that f prime of a if we're talking about the derivative at the point where x equals a. So we could be asked to find the instantaneous rate of change of f at x equals 5, or when, on the interval from 0 to 5, does the average rate of change equal the instantaneous rate of change, right? These things are not the same. Instantaneous rate of change is the derivative. Average rate of change is not the derivative. It's different. 
Average rate of change is not the same thing as instantaneous rate of change. There's a very important difference there. Derivative in units of measure. f prime of a is measured in units of f per unit of a. For example, if our function f is measured in feet and our variable x is measured in seconds, then f prime of x is measured in feet per second. So we think about the units of f and in function notation, we say y equals f of x. So this is like units of y per unit of a. And so here in function notation, a is the independent variable. So think of that like x. For example, let f of x equals 1 over x plus 1 represent the cost in dollars of manufacturing x bracelets. Find f prime of 5 and include units in your answer. So our function f of x represents the cost in dollars. That means the f units are dollars. And the independent variable, the input variable x, is measured in bracelets. So f prime of x is going to be measured in dollars per bracelet. So that would allow us to determine that rate of change, dollars per bracelet. The derivative in slope, f prime of a represents the slope of the line tangent to f at x equals a. This is also referred to as the slope of the curve. So you're probably quite familiar with finding the slope of a line from your study of algebra. But curves can have slopes as well, and that might be a new idea for you. If I asked you to think about slope and finding slope on a graph, you might be picturing a linear function in your head because that's probably at this point all you've ever been asked to find the slope of is a line. But curves can have a slope as well. And the, the big difference between finding the slope of a line and finding the slope of a curve is that on a line, the slope is constant. For a linear function, it has a constant rate of change. The slope is the same at every single point on the line. But on a curve, the slope is always changing. So you have to find the slope at a certain point because it might very well be different than the slope at another point on the curve. Okay, so we have now yet another way to think about derivative. The slope of the curve is another way to describe derivative. And we can also call that the slope of the line tangent to the curve at x equals a. At x equals a, I should have included that there. So f prime of a represents the slope of the line tangent to the function at x equals a. This is also just called the slope of the curve. So we have lots of different ways we can describe the derivative. We can call it the derivative. We can call it the instantaneous rate of change. We can call it the slope of the curve. We can call it the slope of the line tangent to the curve at a certain point. And we might be asked questions like the following. Find the slope of the line tangent to f at x equals 5. Find all points where the slope of f is equal to 0. Find the intervals where f of x has a positive slope. We're going to be talking a lot about slope in this course. Not slopes of lines, necessarily, slopes of curves. The derivative and the tangent line. The equation of the line tangent to our function f at x equals a is given by the following. This is a, a really important equation for us. We're going to be working with this all year long. So you need to memorize this equation. This is just the point-slope form of the equation of a line. Back when you studied, linear functions and you learned how to write the equation of a line, you should have learned that there are three different forms for writing the equation of a line. So let's just write this off to the side. Equation of a line. Slope-intercept form. That's the y equals mx plus 
b. x and y are your variables. x is the independent variable, y is the dependent variable, m is the slope, b is the y-intercept. We also have standard form. The standard form for the equation of a line, ax plus by equals c. Again, x and y are your variables. a, b, and c are constants. This form is useful when you're looking for x and y intercepts. This form makes it easy to find your x and y intercepts. And then the third form is called point slope form. And the point slope form for the equation of a line is the one that we're going to be using in calculus. And that looks like y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So here, if you know the point on a line, any point on the line, you can call that point x1 comma y1 and substitute in those coordinates into the equation here for x1, y1. And then if you know the slope of your line, you substitute that value in for m and you have your point slope form of the equation of the line. And the reason that we're going to be using point slope form is because the slope of the line at a certain point is our derivative. And so we'll be able to find the derivative and then just substitute it in to the m right here. That's the slope. So that's going to be our f prime of a. And then when we find the slope of a function, we find the slope at a particular point. So we'll know what the point is. We'll have the coordinates of the point. And if we have the coordinates of the point, we'll sub them in for the x1 and the y1. So the x-coordinate of our point is a, and the y-coordinate of our point is f of a. So now if we rewrite that equation using our function notation, we have y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a. And that is identical to what we see right here. So this is the equation that we're going to be using for writing the equation of a tangent line to our function f at a certain point x equals a. So questions we might be asked, find the equation of the line tangent to f of x at x equals 5, find the tangent line approximation to f of 5 at x equals 5. So we can use tangent lines to approximate the value of a function. And here's just a summary of what we just talked about. All of these things having to do with the derivative. If f prime of x, if f prime of a exists, we say f of x is differentiable at x equals a. f prime of a gives us the instantaneous rate of change of f at the point x equals a. f prime of a is measured in units of f per unit of a. f prime of a represents the slope of the line tangent to f at x equals a. This is also referred to as the slope of the curve at x equals a. And the equation of the line tangent to f at x equals a is given by y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a. So here we have at the top our definition of derivative. f prime of a equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. In what way is that a limit that we see above related to the illustration below? So I want you to look at these four graphs. These are all the function f. And you can see that there are points plotted on f and the points are changing from graph to graph, but you, I want you to look at these graphs in succession. What's changing from the first graph to the second graph, to the third graph, to the fourth graph? What is it that's changing? And how is that related to the equation that we see above, that definition of the derivative? So pause here and take a minute or two to really think about this. How is the equation at the top related to what we see in the graphs below. I'm going to label this second point a plus h. So then the horizontal distance here between these two points is just h. h, h. And here, we just have a single point in the last graph, so the a and the a plus h are really the same point. 
So here h equals 0. So we see as we progress through these different graphs, the value of h is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's getting closer to 0 until in the last graph, h is 0. There is no distance between the beginning of our interval and the end of our interval. Okay, so that relates to the fact that we're taking a limit as h approaches 0. The h value is getting closer and closer to 0. So the width of that interval is shrinking. And if you'll notice in the first three graphs, the line connecting the two points drawn in pink is a secant line. So that line there, that line there, that line there, these are secant lines. And the slope of the secant line is f of a plus h minus f of a over h. In the last graph, that is no longer a secant line. Now we can call that a tangent line. So when the width of the interval has shrunken so much that it's zero, now we have a tangent line. And the slope of the tangent line is what we get when we take the limit as h approaches zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Okay, so this represents the slope of the tangent line, which also represents the derivative. We can see right here, that is the derivative of f at x equals a. We can also call this instantaneous rate of change. The slope of the secant lines are giving us <clears throat> average rate of change. So as we move through the progression here, the average rate of change is getting closer and closer and closer to the instantaneous rate of change. For this next example, for the function given by f of x equals x minus x squared, use the difference quotient. So the difference quotient is the limit definition of the derivative. That's this thing right here. It's called the difference quotient. We're going to use the difference quotient to compute f prime of 2. f prime of 2 so if this is f prime of a. Now, if we want f prime of 2, it means we're replacing the a with a 2. So in this formula here, we're going to replace all of the a's with 2's. And then we'll talk about the meaning of our answer. OK, so f prime of 2, let's use our limit definition of the derivative, is equal to f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 over h. f of 2 plus h means 2 plus h is our new input. So we're going to go to the function f of x and replace all of the x's with 2 plus h. So that would be 2 plus h minus 2 plus h squared. That's f of 2 plus h. So let's highlight that. f of 2 plus h right there, minus f of 2. f of 2 means go to the function f of x and replace x with 2. So 2 minus 2 squared. And we'll highlight that, f of 2 over h. Now we need to simplify this algebraically. So 2 plus h, we're going to multiply 2 plus h by 2 plus h. That's how I square it. So use foil or distributive property. And then I also have to distribute the negative in front. So it's going to be negative 4 minus 4h minus h squared. And then for minus parentheses 2 minus 2 squared parentheses, I'm going to distribute that negative. So minus 2 plus 4 all over h. And let's combine our like terms. I have a 2 minus a 2 and then a minus 4 plus 4. So all of that combines to be just 0. And then I have plus h minus 4h 
that's going to give me negative 3h minus h squared over h. Let's factor an h from the numerator. And then we have a common factor that we can eliminate. So I'll continue over here. f prime of 2 equals, oh, I forgot something very, very, very important. I forgot this. The limit as h approaches 0. Very, very important because if I don't have the limit as h approaches 0, it is not f prime of a. It is just the average rate of change and not the instantaneous rate of change. So let's fix that right now. I'm just going to scoot this over. Limit as h approaches 0. And I knew I had forgotten it because I got to this point where I wanted to substitute something in for h. Uh, let me just recap this. So limit h approaches 0, negative 3 minus h. Now that we have eliminated the h from the denominator, we're able to find the limit by just substituting 0 in for h. We could have tried doing that right in the beginning here. It's typically when you take a limit, you start by trying substitution. But if we substitute 0 in for h in the first step, we're going to get 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form and tells us nothing. So we had to work through this algebraically until we got to a point where we could eliminate the h in the denominator. And now we can take this limit just by substituting in 0 for the h there. So we get f prime of 2 equals negative 3 minus 0, or just negative 3. Okay, so that negative 3, negative 3 is the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f at x equals 2. So the slope is not constant. The slope is changing depending on um, which point we are at on the graph. I know that's bad, bad grammar. Uh, so if we specifically look at the point on the graph where x equals 2 and then draw a tangent line at that point, the slope of our tangent line would be negative 3. So I have a picture here to show that. We have our function f of x equals x minus x squared graphed in blue. And then if we go to the point on the function where x equals 2, that's this point right here, and we draw a tangent line, the slope of that tangent line is negative 3. And we can see that that's true. Our tangent line is shown in green. And if we go down 3, right 1, we're at another point on the tangent line. Or here if we go up 3, left 1, we're at another point here on the tangent line. So that tangent line does have a slope of negative 3. Now consider the function f whose formula is f equals 3 minus 2x. This is a linear function. It is a linear function. In linear functions, we should know a lot about. You've studied linear functions for quite some time. What can you say about the slope of f at every value of x? Well, just looking at this equation, you should be able to read the slope. The slope is negative 2. The slope is negative 2 at every x value on this function. Part b, compute the average rate of change of f on the intervals from 1 to 4, from 3 to 7, and from 5 to 5 plus h. Simplify each result as much as possible. What do you notice about these quantities? You should be able to think about this and know what the answer is without writing anything down. The average rate of change is just the slope of the line that's going to connect two points on that function. And it's a linear function. If we graph y equals 3 minus 2x, the y-intercept is at 3, the slope is negative 2. So here's our function. I know I don't have a scale here, but there's our linear function. It has a slope of negative 2 at every point on the graph. So what's the average rate of change on the interval from 1 to 4? It's negative 2. 
What's the average rate of change on the interval from 3 to 7? It's negative 2. From 5 to 5 plus h, it's negative 2. If you're not convinced, we can try it. This is our average rate of change formula. On the interval from 1 to 4, we can write it like this. Average rate of change on the interval from 1 to 4 would be f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1. So you would compute f of 4. 3 minus 2 times 4 is negative 5 minus, and then f of 1, 3 minus 2 times 1 is 1 over 4 minus 1. And sure enough, negative 6 over 3 is negative 2. The average rate of change is going to be negative 2 on any interval for a linear function. So we're just going to get negative 2 each time. Use the limit definition of the derivative to compute the exact instantaneous rate of change of f with respect to x at the value a equals 1. So we should also be getting negative 2 because we know the slope of our curve is negative 2 for any point on the curve. We could work it out the long way, right? We could find limit h approaches 0, f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h, and go through all of the steps. f of 1 plus h would be 3 minus 2 times 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h. So that's 3 minus 2 minus 2h minus 1 over h. Three minus two minus one is zero, so minus two h over h. We can eliminate the h in the numerator and the denominator. That's the limit as h approaches zero of negative two equals negative two. Sure enough, we got negative two, and we will always get negative two. So without doing any additional computations, what are the values of f prime of two, f prime of pi, and f prime of negative root two? No surprise there, the answer is just going to be negative 2 every single time. We want to find how the volume of a balloon changes as it's filled with air. We know the equation v of r equals 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius in inches and v is the volume in cubic inches. Then what does v of 3 minus v of 1 over 3 minus 1 represent? So let me write it here in the middle again. v of 3 minus v of 1 over 3 minus 1. So think of that as f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Actually, it's not terribly helpful to, to use that version of the formula. Let's use the other version of the formula. f of b minus f of a over b minus a. This is the average rate of change of our function f and the f in this case is v, so it's the average rate of change of v, average rate of change of volume. So it's not the average rate of change of radius, not the average rate of change of radius, it's the average rate of change of volume. With respect to the radius, if you go back to our definition of derivative, with respect to the radius, the with respect to is always going to define for you what your independent variable is with respect to tells us what the independent variable is. If you don't remember the difference between independent variable and dependent variable, the independent variable is the input. It's like the x if your function is in y equals mx or y equals the function of x form. So both of these options say with respect to radius, which is good. So we, we know that these are volumes that we're subtracting in the numerator and radii that we're subtracting in the denominator. So it should be average rate of change of volume with respect to radius. And then is it when the radius changes from 1 to 3 inches or is it when the volume changes from 1 to 3 cubic inches? Well, it's the radius that's changing from 1 to 3 inches, so it should be c. Which of the following represents the slope of a line drawn between the two points marked in the figure? We can label our points. That's the point with an x-coordinate of a, so the y-coordinate would be f of a. 
And here's the point with an x-coordinate at b, so the y-coordinate would be f of b. And how do you calculate the slope between those two lines? Well, use your y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 formula, which would be f of b minus f of a over b minus a. The line tangent to the graph of f at x, the line, sorry, the line tangent to the graph of f of x equals x at the point 0, 0. So here's our function, y equals x. Here's our point, 0, 0. If we want the slope of our tangent line, so we want to write the equation of the tangent line, which is, remember, y minus f of a equals f prime of a times x minus a. And we know that the x-coordinate is 0 and the y-coordinate is 0, so we can fill that in. What is the slope of our tangent line? The slope of our tangent line is the slope of the curve at this point, and our curve is linear. f of x equals x, that's a linear equation. You should be able to look at that equation and tell me what the slope is, because it's the same at every single point on the graph. The slope is 1. So our tangent line equation is y equals 1 times x, or just y equals x. Suppose f of x is a function where f of 2 equals 15 and f prime of 2 equals 3. Estimate f of 2.5. We're going to use a tangent line equation again. y minus f of 2 equals f prime of 2 times x minus 2, like that. So f of 2 equals 15 tells us that the point 2 comma 15 is on the graph. And then the slope at the point where x equals 2 is 3. So we fill in our point. There's the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. And here's the slope at that point. At the point where x is 2 and y is 15, the slope is 3. So now we have our tangent line equation, y minus 15 equals 3 times x minus 2. And we want to estimate f of 2.5 using this tangent line equation. So we will let x equal 2.5. If you wanted to solve this for y, you can. We'll do 15 plus 3 times x minus 2. Just so now I can write the, this notation y of 2.5 is 15 plus 3 times 2.5 minus 2. So y of 2.5 equals 15 plus 2.5 minus 2 is 0.5, and 3 times 0.5 is 1.5, and 15 plus 1.5 is 16.5. And that wraps up our notes for today. So we've looked at lots of ways to interpret the derivative, and we're going to continue to study the derivative throughout this unit.